Keep rolling. Um, so it's uh, my great pleasure and honor to introduce Micah Bartels. Micah uh, traveled from Europe to be with us today. Um, Micah is uh, a psychologist and behavior geneticist who has made uh, really fundamental contributions to placing well being. Uh, squarely within the crosshairs of modern biobehavioral science. Uh, she has been at uh, the Free University of, um, uh, 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 of Amsterdam. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Dutch proper title, um, but uh, uh, that is uh, um, what it is. And she has been there actually since she's been an undergraduate. She has received her bachelor's and PhD uh, and um, continued. And she is now university chair professor uh, in genetics and well-being uh, in the Department of Biological Psych Psychology. Micah has published um, hundreds of papers. And among those are some seminal um, papers, one in nature genetics, uh, on a, um, which I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about today, on a um, genome wide study of the well being spectrum, uh, which really helped to place uh, well being uh, on the map and began to, be, uh, begins to articulate some of the um, biological contributions to well being. She's also published work on some of the um, other biological and molecular underpinnings, uh, as well as some really influential review papers to help um, uh, uh, underscore the importance of this topic in many different areas of the biobehavioral sciences. She's currently president of the um, International Positive Psychology Association, uh, she is past president of the Behavior Genetics Society or Association, uh, and um, uh, uh, she works at uh, um, many different levels of analysis within uh, humans, uh, and uh, we're, I think, in for a treat today. So thank you so much, Micah, for coming, and let's give Micah a welcome. Thank you, Richie, for this uh, lovely uh, introduction. It's wonderful to be here, although it's, uh, it's a long flight to go to the US. But I haven't been to the US for two years. And uh, normally I was in the US for like twice or three times a year to visit collaborators or conferences. Uh, and uh, well, the whole experience of waiting in line everywhere at an airport was actually for the first time nice because uh, it's, it's nice to be here, to meet people. Uh, I think we can't replace what we do uh, online because uh, we have to meet each other. We have to chat, we have to see different talks. We have to see talks that are completely out of your uh, area, like the ones I saw. I know a bit about the brain. I'm a biological psychologist, but not at this level of detail. And maybe I normally I would have zoomed out or do something different while I'm behind my computer screen and I, I was here and I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I also was very impressed by all your in-depth questions. Very impressive. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is to take you uh, through the history of the genetics of well-being. Um, like Richie said, I'm trained in uh, the field of behavior genetics. Uh, and my uh, PhD was about psychopathology and the development throughout childhood. And when I finished my PhD, uh, I wrote this lovely discussion section of my thesis. And I literally wrote down that about 25% of the children developed some kind of psychopathology throughout their childhood. That's in my case, it was between the age of five and 12. And at that moment, I got stuck by the fact that the majority of children are doing well. Um, and my, my own children were very young at that moment. And I was always also stuck by the fact that everybody was worried about adolescence. Adolescence was terrible. Adolescents do terrible things. And I thought, well, I know a lot of these children, I still call them children, that are lovely, do well, function well in the world. So why are we ignoring the better part of the world? Uh, we always put them into the control group. 
And I think that we can learn from them to, uh, to uh, help in the end, of course, those who suffer. Yeah. Where is the, well, I can do it like this, it's stuck. I pushed all the buttons. <laughs> It's like it only works when you're testing it. Center is also forward. Okay, thanks. All right, so, um, and my talk is actually a very nice link to Bo's talk, or actually com something completely different, because I'm going to talk about individual differences. Um, and uh, I think it's important that these two fields at some point come together to understand what's really happening, especially in humans, of course. Uh, so this is the reality of uh, the Netherlands, but also of Europe and actually the United States. Uh, it actually shows that about one out of five, uh, maybe even a bit more now due to the past two years, uh, is uh, having mental problems. Then we have a, 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 like an unobserved group, the orange people, uh, that do have symptoms but don't have a diagnosis yet, but are the risky group to develop uh, a mental disorder. And then as you see, the majority, although it's gray, it's not the, the, the most positive color, uh, are doing well in a very complex world. So if we put these people in a normal distribution, it would look like this. Um, and we have the, uh, the threshold of being having a diagnosis, which is still uh, often uh, a dichotomy. Uh, probably all the psychiatrists in the room don't agree with it. It's just the way it works. Uh, and if we don't do anything, uh, we have these orange people that will start tumbling over. And my main aim with doing all this research is in the end to learn more about the people that do well and then help those who suffer and in the end actually shift the whole distribution. Having less mental problems, having less people in the risk group, be having more people that do well in the world. Well, then uh, the field of well-being is relatively new. Uh, and you would think, well, if we start a new field, we will do it well. We would have learned from other fields, but we didn't. Because what we did, we, wait, we made one big mess of the phenotype. So the question, what is well-being, is the question I get most often, uh, like in general talks, but also in funding interviews or whatever. Uh, and it's always one of the major reasons, if I don't get the funding, the report always states, we are not clear about what well-being is. So, well, we try to change that, and that's what we also try to do with our work, to have the rigorous uh, genetic approaches to a very complex phenotype to sort out what well-being is. But throughout the talk, I will use the term well-being, uh, and sometimes we define it with a survey that assesses uh, satisfaction with life, sometimes it's quality of life, and sometimes it's happiness. Uh, I'm not going to show it, but we use genetic informative approaches to show that for our work, it doesn't really matter. The genetic correlation is about 0.9 between these assessments. Well, the, I think the state is getting better for well-being. Uh, normally, uh, all these big governmental organizations focused on health, um, mainly physical health, and the people that were healthy were ignored, and they all changed their uh, viewpoints and their top priorities now well-being. So I think we should study well-being and we under should understand why people uh, are doing well. Although, if you look at the most work they do, they, of course, focus on those who suffer in the world. And that's mainly because we can only focus on a limited thing, part of things and suffering should be out of the world first. But what do they do in general is that they compare two groups of people. So they want to learn more about well-being and then say, OK, we have a group and we compare it to another group. As an example, one of the major questions, uh, especially from the field of economics, is always what is the link between well-being and income or well-being and socioeconomic status? Um, 
And then they take a group of uh, people with a higher socioeconomic status or, or a higher income and compare it to people with a lower income. Another one is living in a city or outside of city. Well, this is, I'm from Amsterdam. Uh, I'm from a lovely country. So uh, some people prefer to live in our wonderful cities. Some people uh, prefer to live in the more rural areas. We are a tiny country. So there's like 50 minutes in between these two areas. So it doesn't really matter in the Netherlands. Um, but people still compare these two groups. A big question, do people want to, are people happier if they live in a city or are they happier when they live in a rural area? Food, important thing. We are all working uh, on in the field of health in general. Uh, is there a link between food intake uh, and uh, well-being? And finally, one of the pressing questions, of course, is the use of the mobile phone or any device, especially in children. Uh, but I think you all also have to admit that you probably use your phone too much and maybe that would affect your well-being or maybe not. Well, I'm not going to give uh, the answers to this question because I think the answers are very complex because we are all different. So the differences within the groups are often larger than the differences between the groups. So we can't compare two groups to give this, uh, uh, to answer these questions. We actually should ask follow-up people, for example, or uh, study the genetics to understand the individual differences. So to come back to the rural and the urban area, there's a very large genetic predisposition in people that love to live in a city or love to live in a rural area. The problem with that is that it's often driven by socioeconomic status. So you have to be relatively rich and old to in the end live where you love to live, given your genetic predisposition. So it's a very complex question, and I don't think that many governments can solve that. The answer to what are the causes of individual differences is very simple. For anything we measure in a human being, and probably also in an animal, uh, is the answer is that, that it's an interplay between your genetic predisposition and the environment you're exposed to. There's nothing in a human being we have assessed over the past 15 years in genetically informative designs that actually provided the answer of zero heritability. So genes always matter and the environment always matters. It's also not a, like, is it genes or the environment? That's, a, that's an outdated question. It's always genes and environment. So there is no nature-nurture debate. There is a nature-nurture interplay and a nature-nurture correlation. So what do we know about the genome in relation to well-being? Well, the field is young. Uh, and in that sense, the genetics of uh, well-being started off with a brilliant study, a very strong study, and a study you actually don't want to repeat. Because this study was based on identical twins, like the ones that are captured in these pictures, that have been separated at birth. So they were born, they were separated, they were raised in totally different environments, and they were brought together when they were adults. And in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, they have a, a very substantial twin register that brings together twins like these, and they assess everything you can assess in a human being, like well-being. And what they observed is actually that twins like this, so they are genetically identical, they are each other's clones, that grew up in different areas, are more similar if, with respect to well-being than dizygotic twins, and dizygotic twins are as similar as normal brothers and sisters. So share on average genetic, 50% of their genetic material, but grow up in the same area. These twins are more similar. So that's very strong evidence that genes do matter for well-being. And based on uh, this particular study that was published in 1988, uh, the conclusion was that about 37% of the differences between people is accounted for by genetic differences. Well, then uh, there was a publication in Nature Genetics uh, over 25 years ago, uh, and uh, Dean Hammer had a lot of uh, ideas about the genetics of well-being, and these were his expectations. So he said, well, there probably is a gene, a gene that explains about 5% of the variants. Um, he thought in total it would be 10 to 20 genetic locations. Uh, and he was expecting it to be mainly in the dopamine and the serotonin system. So keep that in mind while we progress along the timeline. 
Well, then there was the development of the twin studies and luckily not with twins, twins were at a part. Uh, actually, that's not allowed anymore around the world to separate twins. It uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but uh, the sample sizes are relatively small, but the birth of twins is very frequent. It's actually becoming more and more frequent, mainly due to the aging of the mothers. It's not only the techniques we develop, but it's simply the aging of the mothers uh, that induces the double ovulation, meaning the dizygotic twins. Um, so there are many twin studies. There are twin registries uh, almost in any country in the world now. Uh, and we have the Netherlands twin register that is already about 40 years old and is uh, 40 years longitudinal data and is one of the biggest in the world. And using uh, all these twin studies from all around the world, we actually uh, have this paper by uh, Varniel Bangnes from Norway uh, that actually explains the implications of these findings. So very important, uh, if you talk about heritability, it doesn't mean that happiness can't change. She focuses especially on happiness, but it doesn't matter for the study. Um, and that's a very important uh, statement. So it's not a static outcome. It's not this static set point that was claimed. It just means that differences between people are partly accounted for by genetic differences, but we could shift the whole distribution. We keep the differences, but we can make everybody happier if we know the right intervention. If you talk about stability of happiness in individuals, the stability over time within the same individual is often related to genetic stability. If there is a change in happiness of it within a person over time, it's often due to environmental change. And that's not only specific to happiness. This is always also what you find for, find for uh, cognition, for psychopathology. So stability is often driven by the genetic part. Environmental influences, we always specify shared environment. It's the environment you share with your family members, uh, like diet, uh, other habits you have in your family, where you live, the exposure you have to certain environmental exposure due to the area where you live versus individual specific environment. And it's mainly the individual spe specific environment that drives change. Uh, and the beauty of genetic designs, and that's what of people often don't realize, is that it's the ideal design to study environmental effects because you can control for a lot of differences that are in people's genes. Well, what we did in 2015 is take all these twin family studies on well-being together. Uh, and we uh, came up with a meta-analytic, meta oh, that's too fast, uh, heritability estimate of 36%. You can see that's completely in line based on the first study on twins right apart. Uh, we have a relatively tiny confidence interval due to the, uh, the large uh, amount of twins in this study. This is the table that comes with the paper. Uh, these are the studies that are independent. Uh, the dots are the heritability estimates of the specific studies, uh, of course, with their uh, confidence bars. Uh, you can see that some studies are bigger than others, so the uh, findings are less reliable. Uh, and in total, there is a sample size of about 55,000 individuals. So it's a very robust estimate of the heritability. Uh, the beauty of uh, psychology, hopefully for all fields of science, is that there can be replications. So in the exact same time, uh, without knowing it from each other, my Norwegian colleagues did the, the exact same thing. They had a bit of different inclusion criteria, but in the end, they ended up with the same conclusion with overlapping confidence intervals. So there's actually no discussion anymore about the heritability of well-being, with the limitation that the twin studies so far are in European ancestry samples and in European, US, or Australian countries. Given that it's a relative estimate relative to the environment, you can, of course, uh, expect different estimates if you go to different environments. Then for the interpretation, it often goes wrong, so I want to emphasize this. Uh, the conclusion is 40% genes, 60% environment. Uh, and then the, the first conclusion everybody draws, especially in popular science books or in magazines or whatever, is that 40% of your happiness is in your genes and 60% is due to environmental exposure. This is the wrong interpretation because I've been talking about individual differences. Uh, and most times when I claim that, everybody says, but Sonia has the book with the pie. This is the book with the pie. And this is Sonia. Uh, 
Uh, and this is uh, at the IPA, the Positive Psychology Association Conference in Melbourne, uh, a couple of years ago. And Sonia says, well, I have three regrets about the pie chart. And one of her regrets, this was my favorite moment of the whole conference, is stating that it's always misinterpreted wrongly. The pie is about variance. It's not about happiness within an individual. So keep that in mind forever. If you talk about heritability, it's about populations and differences between people. Well, while we were working on the meta-analysis, there was a lot of progress uh, in the field of genetics, of course. So first we had genetically informative designs. Uh, we had a couple of uh, candidate gene studies. I will don't mention any because uh, we made all the progress and we know that they are unreliable. Uh, because the human uh, physiology and, and well-being or any phenotype is way too complex to capture in one gene. But there was another uh, method developed, a very elegant method to my opinion, is uh, based on molecular genetic material. So you take all the SNPs you can assess at an array, uh, the ones that are common in humans, otherwise uh, you can't study them for a complex trait like this. Um, and we reported a SNP heritability of 5 to 10 percent. That's way lower than the twin heritability. So we have what we call about 30% missing heritability. And we're trying to fill that gap, but it will take a while. We're now we're actually going to understand the missing heritability in height, the most simple phenotype in human beings uh, from last year onwards. So it will take a long time before we understand the missing heritability of well-being. To show you uh, the elegance of the design, it's very simple. We had about 10K individuals. We had DNA material from them and we had a well being assessment. And the only thing you do in this design is wonder if people that have similar scores for well being also have more similar DNA. So in this case, people rate their life uh, on the Cantrell ladder from zero to 10. Uh, and this person provides a nine to his life. She says, it's My life is worth an eight. And she says, a Five. Uh, and the question is, is their DNA more similar if their scores more similar? And based on that, we were able to estimate these heritabilities. So 10% uh, for, for happiness, a bit lower for enjoyment. And if we combine them, uh, we still are about at about 10%. Very large confidence intervals, so not a very strong method. But it was the first evidence that there is molecular genetic information that is linked to well-being. Well, then the, the study, uh, and that's not, not yet the study uh, Richie was referring to. Then we thought, well, if it's in the genes, let's try to do the genome-wide association analysis. Uh, and uh, that was a very long trajectory. It was finally published in 2016. Uh, we had some variants identified. And if we took uh, uh, the uh, variants expressed, it was about 4%. So it was in the range of the SNP heritability, but of course, very, very low. Um, well, I don't have to explain probably to you that we looked at uh, all these genetic variants within individuals uh, to see if uh, people that have different scores for well-being have different genetic variants. It was a huge enterprise. Uh, we didn't have, for example, the UK Biobank at that time. So we didn't have the about uh, 500,000 individuals that were already genotyped and had a well-being measure. So we, in the end, ended up with uh, about 300,000 individuals. We had 2.2 million genetic variants per individual, and it was a huge collaboration. Again, very important, only European ancestry, uh, based on the fact that, especially back in the days, uh, genetic material was not available in other areas in the world at such a large scale, which is changing rapidly, uh, luckily, because we, of course, can't understand part of the world and don't understand the rest of the world. What's the outcome? The outcome of a GWAS study is always captured in an, a Manhattan plot. Uh, it's, well, it still doesn't really look like a Manhattan plot. Uh, there are different variants. We have sometimes call this the Amsterdam plot. But it still was a breakthrough because what you see in this plot is the chromosomes. It's 22 in human beings. And uh, all these blue things are the dots. So the 2.2 million variants are captured in a dot. The, uh, y-axis is presenting the outcome of the statistical test. And what you do is 2.2 million times link one variant to well-being. So it's a lot of testing and there's a lot of multiple testing correction. Uh, and when you do that, you end up with three variants that actually jump out of the crowd uh, in a pile of SNPs above the significance threshold. 
big step because we were able to identify significant SNPs linked to well-being. On the other hand, useless because if you only have three SNPs out of 2.2 million, uh, you shouldn't start any biological interpretation, of course. So it was a major step forward, but it learned us that it should be something there, but we couldn't do any interpretation. But we could, of, of course, use this for polygenic risk score analysis uh, by using all the information that came out of the study. It explains, in the end, uh, less than 1% of the variance if you only look at the significant ones. And there was no evidence for dopamine or serotonin whatsoever. So if you go back to the predictions that were made that there would be one gene explaining 5% of the variance, serotonin and uh, uh, dopamine, and nothing there. Then um, we continued. Uh, well being is studied often in adults, also mainly driven by the fact uh, that you need to have data. And having data in adults is way easier than having data in children. Uh, but we had data in uh, the Netherlands Twin Register in children. Uh, so we looked at the heritage stability of the heritability. It's not a longitudinal design, so it's different people in the different age groups. But we saw a relatively stable heritability estimate which is not always the case. So people that are a bit familiar with the uh, behavioral genetic literature maybe know that the heritability for IQ, for example, increases very steeply after the age of 12. And same for the heritability of uh, uh, sports participation and exercise. So it's fascinating to see that for well-being, the stability of the heritability is very strong. So there's no more shared environmental influences in childhood um, in comparison to adulthood. Then what we didn't discuss so far, I'm not going to uh, jump into the details now, but maybe it could be part of the discussion, is of course the phenotype of well-being. In the beginning, I mentioned satisfaction with life, happiness, quality of life, but you also have meaning in life, the more eudaimonic assessments of well-being. Uh, and given that we are uh, one of our main drivers of our research also to understand the phenotype, and we took the um, data of the UK Biobank, uh, it's huge, it's a lot of people, and they have one question, I consider my life to be meaningful, which is from a phenotypic perspective, of course, not that much, but it's a question in a very big sample. Uh, and we uh, uh, calculated the SNP heritability, also 6%, but our main uh, reason for doing so was to calculate the genetic correlation between happiness and meaning in life. Um, and a genetic correlation actually is a, a description of the overlap in genetic variants that are underlying the phenotypic association. The phenotypic association in the UK Biobank is about 0.6. The genetic correlation is about 0.8. So it's mainly the same sets of genes that influence meaning in life and happiness uh, in this big sample. Then after we did the first genome-wide association study, the, 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 well, the most normal way people take is to do it again with a bigger sample. And at that point we had the UK Biobank uh, also 23andMe was included with a bigger sample. And most of the participating cohorts also increased in their DNA samples. So we did it again uh, with a much bigger sample and we found over 300 genetic variants that actually explained the well-being spectrum. Well, what's the well-being spectrum? Uh, I did this together with PhD student Bart Bazemans and uh, now uh, assistant professor Michel Nivar. Um, due to our first study, we found that there was a very strong genetic correlation between happiness, depression, and neuroticism. That's not unexpected because you also observe a phenotypic correlation. And because we need power, we integrated the results of the study and made one phenotype. And we developed a new multivariate method where we could actually test different methods and could test if a SNP would be important for happiness and depression and neuroticism, or maybe only for happiness, maybe only for depression, maybe only for neuroticism, and all the variations. And then we weighted all the different models to come to the best outcome. Well, this is the Manhattan plot. Um, you can see that it ch completely changed the picture in comparison to the first G1 study. Uh, the, the change of the picture is mainly based on the number of observations. We couldn't say people again, because we were talking about multivariate assessment. So we have multiple phenotypes. But still, there are a lot of more people included. We had over 2 million observations. And as you can see, 
every uh, little triangle is a significant SNP. So that's over 300 uh, locations everywhere on the human genome. So there's not one particular chromosome strongly linked to well-being in comparison to other ones. And at that point, we thought, well, this is actually a source for more interpretation because we have that many variants. You can see, well, what could we learn from these variants? And um, one step we took is to look at the gene expression. So you have large databases in the world that you can, if you find significant SNPs, you can see in the database where these genetic variants are expressed. Well, the first step we took is to see if it was expressed in the brain or in other parts of the body. Uh, it sounds like a silly question, of course, because you're not expecting these genes to be expressed in your arm or in your foot. Uh, but indeed, it, the main, mainly expressed in the brain, also a bit of expression in muscles, but that's also due to the fact that we know a lot about gene expression in muscles. Then we zoomed in, in the brain, and we made a relative comparison between different brain areas. So this is a relative assessment of gene expression in that certain brain area in comparison to the other ones. So it's not an absolute assessment. What you see here, it looks like uh, standard MRI uh, studies in which you uh, give, give people a task. In this case, it's gene expression. Uh, and you look at the, uh, the hippocampus, actually the subiculum is a part of the hippocampus. And we saw a relative overexpression of the genetic variants that are linked to well-being in these brain areas. Well, that is a finding. We, we still don't know what it means. Um, there are a couple of limitations uh, because gene expression is not assessed in every brain er area in the same amount. The, so the chances of finding gene expression in the hippocampus is bigger than in other brain areas. But if you correct for all these uh, limitations, it still holds. And it was a bit in line, but maybe not in line with what we found a couple of years earlier, where we found a nonlinear association between the size of the hippocampus and well-being. Uh, and of course, you never know if a size of a certain brain area is also linked to expression of genes. Uh, so it's a different, of course, a totally different measure. But the hippocampus is, of course, not an unknown brain area for mental health uh, in general. Then the exposome. And normally when I talk about the genome uh, and the exposome, uh, people think, well, we know a lot about the environment, but we don't know that much about the genome. Uh, I think for well-being, we don't, almost don't know nothing about the environment. There are many studies focusing on the environment, but they all follow the standard pick and choose approach. So they pick one environmental variable and they don't correct for any genetic differences and then claim a big effect. One of the most studied ones is being in greener areas or um, yeah, being at seaside, for example. If you don't correct for genetic predisposition, you probably pick out the people that prefer to be in greener areas, which is not everybody. That so often sounds difficult to people who prefer greener areas, but not everybody loves to be in greener areas. So there actually, there wasn't any study that did the same systematic approach as for the genes. So we, we gave it a try. Um, we did the first exome, uh, exposome-wide association study. Uh, and actually that has a lot of limitations because if you do a genome-wide association study, you know the structure of the genomes. You know the structure, you know the LD structure, so you know which genes come together, which genetic variants. For the environment, we don't know, and there's probably not such a stable structure in the environment. So it's a way less stable than the genome, uh, but uh, limitations shouldn't be the reason for not trying to do something. So what did we do? We have the data of the Netherlands Twin Register. We took a sample of 7,000 individuals with a satisfaction with life measure, uh, and we have a postal code-based environmental information in this uh, consortium where they actually took everything that's known in the Netherlands based on the postal code. Uh, to give you an uh, example, we had uh, pre-registered this study because we didn't know what would happen. So uh, we thought, well, let's write everything down we're going to do. And I will also tell you what went wrong by pre-registering. It's, it's a very complex process. I think it's the way forward, but it's very complex because you realize things when you are doing your study. Uh, but that's also the beauty of it. So you have to explain in your paper that you didn't realize something. Um, so we had uh, 
uh, over 160 variables in the 21 categories. And you can see the categories here. So everything you can assess reasonably based on the postal coast. You have to keep in mind that the Netherlands is a tiny country. So everything that's linked to your postal code might not be the area where you frequently are. So that's also a limitation, but. And this uh, diagram is actually trying to mimic uh, the Manhattan plot. Uh, so we have all the variables, environmental variables down here from air pollution to the use of the land, uh, to how much rental outlets there are, accessibility, uh, sports facilities. And this is again, the outcome of the statistical test uh, with correction for multiple testing. Uh, and the dots represent the specific variables and everything that jumps out above this line is significant for well-being. The one thing we lacked to pre-register is do any kind of socioeconomic status correction. So we lack to uh, correct, to pre-register to correct for socioeconomic status of the neighborhood or for socioeconomic status of the individual, although we had the information. So when we did in the end, so you can do the pre-registration and then in the paper you say, okay, we have some follow-up non-pre-registered analysis because we were relatively stupid not uh, putting that in the pre-registration. And when we did that, uh, we actually had a very interesting outcome because the only two that actually uh, kept on being significant was safety. So safety is regardless of the socioeconomic status of the neighborhood or regardless of the socioeconomic status of the individual, one of the environmental factors that's linked to well-being. Uh, the beauty, to my opinion, is, is that that's something that is open for policy officers to pick up right now and change for every area in the world. Um, so it's also, of course, relatively disappointing that everything that was claimed so far didn't come out significant. I don't say it's not significant because this is also only one study with its own limitations, but there's actually no evidence about green areas or access to sports facilities. Um, but as, as I said, it's based on postal codes. So maybe if you have sports facilities like two streets away from your own postal codes, still closer than any other people. Then, of course, you are all aware of the fact that COVID hit the world. Um, and um, we thought, well, uh, we didn't think that in the first couple of weeks because we were totally uh, shut down and didn't know what to do. But then we thought, okay, we have this huge twin register. Let's just send out a simple survey to everybody. Let's see what happens. Uh, because we have this line of well-being research, we included well-being questions. Uh, so we published uh, so far two papers uh, because we have a genetically informative design. And we were wondering about all the claims that were, that were made about the effects on well-being. So during our data collection and during the writing of this paper, the first, or actually the ninth World Happiness Report came out that already showed that there wasn't a very big effect on well-being uh, due to the COVID pandemic. And then the 10th World Happiness Report came out two weeks ago, also showed that actually there's a relatively uh, big stability in the averages of the country when you speak about well-being. But we thought maybe there's a gene by environment interaction, not particular only for COVID, of course, but to learn from gene by crisis interactions. What happens to well-being? What happens to the heritability of well-being? What happens to the influence of the environment? Uh, I will only focus on the second one, but the results are more or less, or let, let's get back one. The fascinating things you see if you talk about gene environment action is that uh, you see a change in the genetic architecture. And what you often see if it's a negative, very strong negative environmental change is that the environment is getting more important. First of all, you see an increase in environment or in total variance. So some people re react more strongly than other people. Uh, so you see a change in uh, heritability uh, and uh, this was optimism and meaning in life. So the heritability of optimism went down from 26 to 20% and for meaning in life from 32 to 25%. And there was also a big reduction in the heritability of well-being due to the pandemic uh, for quality of life. So the control letter from zero to 10. To jump into details of this study a bit more, uh, it was done by uh, two of my collaborators. Uh, first about the, the sample. So we had about 25,000 individuals with a pre-pandemic quality of life assessment. 
Uh, and we uh, had 17,000 people that actually responded in the first two months of the pandemic, which was impressive to us uh, that they were uh, actually interested in responding to a survey while they were also surviving and trying to understand what happened in the world. Uh, we, see, we do see a significant decrease in uh, quality of life from 7.7, .7, which is a bit over the Dutch average in the World Happiness Report because we are a voluntary sample, to 7.0 which is still a very high average, of course, for well-being on a scale from zero to 10 uh, in the, the first months of the pandemic. How did the differences look like? We, we average is, I think, uh, relatively empty if you don't look at uh, individual chains. So this is the, the different score within individual, different scores, pre-pandemic versus pandemic, about 11,000 people had two measurements. So we had a very strong group to test that. And you can see that there are a couple of people that had a major increase, a couple of people that had a major decrease, but in the end, there was only like maybe one point or even maybe two points of a difference in the well-being score between pre-pandemic and pandemic assessments. Then of course, important to see that if you are already at a very high level of well-being, it's not that easy to increase. And if you are a very low level, it's not e that easy to decrease. And that's what you also observe in this diagram. This is the absolute numbers. This is maybe more important. You can see that, for example, uh, people that uh, pre-pandemic gave a six to their life, about uh, less, about 20% decreased. So they actually went to a negative number under six, and six is in the Netherlands, the holy grail of being just enough. So uh, they went actually down to a problematic number. Um, about 50% increased, uh, and the remainder of the people stayed stable. The most important message is that there are individual differences. So it's not that everybody decreased in their well being. It's also, of course, not that everybody increased, but there are increases and decreases. And from my point of view, we should learn as much from the increasers as we do from the decreasers, because it's, of course, very fascinating that in April, May, uh, of 2020, people increased in their level of well being while the world shut down. Uh, then, what happened to the heritability? Like I mentioned, this is the heritability from the meta analysis. We took a bit of a different approach in this study because we didn't look at twin pairs only, we took the whole families into account. That gives us a bit more power for environmental estimates. So, the heritability pre pandemic was uh, 31%, and in the pandemic, that reduced to 15% with a very strong increase in environmental effects. Also very important finding that during crisis situations like a pandemic, the environment is important. So we could work with the environment uh, to help people. Then from that point onwards, we're of course uh, doing new studies. Uh, we uh, are studying a uh, study that I'm not going to specify uh, we're studying the worldwide heritability at the moment. So we are contacting all the twin registers around the world to overcome this European ancestry-based heritability estimate to see what's happening in uh, different populations, not only from a molecular genetic perspective, because I think in that sense, molecular genetic analysis are ahead of behavior genetic analysis, but to see uh, what the amount of variance explanation by genes and environment is in different populations and different environments, especially. Then we are setting up uh, an EMA study. Uh, one of the biggest problems, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning in the field of well being, still is the phenotype. Uh, most of the research so far, older genetic research, but most of the other research is based on surveys, a very static measure of well being. Although we see stability, it's of course a measure that's only at one moment in time, at one year, and, and maybe often there's a gap of months or, or years between. Um, we are interested in uh, the daily variation of individuals, and we know from different studies that there is, of course, also a heritability or genetic effect on stability and change throughout the day. Some people are very stable, some people do have a lot of fluctuations, uh, and, uh, well, sometimes it's said that fluctuation is good, but sometimes it's claimed that it's not good, and uh, we do this all in a genetically informative design, so we will have information about uh, the influence of genes and environment on stability of change, uh, because it's twin pairs and it's also twin pairs that do have uh, molecular genetic material. 
That's one. And another uh, big one we are setting up at the moment is to use uh, other sources of data to assess well-being in collaboration with uh, people from uh, the University of Pennsylvania and from Stanford uh, that have been applying the social media approaches for years already. And every time when I saw them at uh, conferences, I asked them about the individual differences and about the genetic effects on uh, social media language use. Uh, and they, of course, uh, didn't have the answer because you need a genetically informative design. So we are actually, uh, well, next week are going to invite uh, over 200,000 twin pairs uh, to provide us with their social media data. They probably won't do that, not all at least. Um, it took us a long time to get the permission from Facebook. Uh, very complicated, we do Facebook and Twitter and we're now working on Instagram, but that's more uh, photo driven. So it's very hard to, uh, to get data out of it, or harder at least. Um, in the meantime, because we were struggling with uh, Facebook, uh, we wrote a systematic review that will also be online next week about the value. Uh, and this is a field where you see the value, like see increase by the day, mainly due to the development of methods to identify something that is meaningful out of the big mess of data. So there's a lot of development, of course, in machine learning approaches that do not always provide uh, an interpretable answer, but for language, they uh, are relatively strong at the moment. There are international models for that, so uh, we will be able to, uh, to assess well-being with all, all kinds of phenotypes in a big group of individuals in a genetically informative design. To summarize, um, the heritability is stable, is strong, uh, based on uh, uh, environments like Europe, United States and Australia. Uh, the heritability is about 40%. Uh, we are now trying to get a hold of different environments uh, because we, of course, you see already by the pandemic effects that the environment could change and have heritability is a relative uh, measure. Um, if you use genetic material, the heritability estimates about 5% now, meaning that we, there's a lot of missing information. Uh, there is a lot of progress. Uh, we will not be the first to use that information nowadays because I think a lot, of, a lot of the missing heritability is, for example, based on rare variants, uh, is what we saw for height, it's what we see for schizophrenia. Uh, and I, I think for something as complex as well being, uh, also schizophrenia is complex as well, of course, it will be hard, <coughs> excuse me, to find a rare variant that explains enough of the population. Uh, and we are interested in explaining differences in the population. Um, so I think we will. Uh, have that gap for several years. I hope we will be able to identify more SNPs, common SNPs, to get a better hold of the biology. Um, important, uh, we have a paper that come out next week, I think, about um, the Canada genes. In the field of well-being, there are still uh, people that conduct Canada gene studies. Uh, hopefully I can now uh, at least ask you uh, don't do that. It's actually simply said a waste of money. Uh, what we did is to take, took all the Canada gene study and took the GWAS results uh, and none of the Canada genes that have ever have been claimed to be useful for well-being came up close to any significance in a genome-wide association study. Simply because I think it's, it's way too simple to depend on a system uh, as the serotonin dopamine system. Uh, so, so far there's no evidence that we should search for these genes, uh, it's way more complex. Environment is very important, uh, also very hard to study. So I also invite people to put their time and brains into how can we get a hold of the environment, given that everybody is different, uh, especially because uh, there's in gene environment interplay. So the environment is not something random that is thrown over people and has an effect. Uh, you have the gene environment interaction where your genotype actually determines your sensitivity to the environment. Uh, that's a mechanism that's studied relatively often, but there's also gene environment correlation. The environment correlation means that part of the uh, environment you're exposed to is picked out by yourself based on your genes, or the environment is in response to your genotype or to your behavior, and in that sense, to your genotype. So it's a very complex mechanism, but it's in the end uh, provides the answers to differences in well-being. 
Um, to give you one example as the, the final uh, slide is um, there's always been uh, an observed strong association between well-being and social connection. Uh, and there's also often very strong claims about social connections make you happier. Uh, and we studied this in a, in a relatively big group of adolescents. We had uh, various assessments of uh, social environment. For example, family functioning, family conflict, uh, where they did spend their leisure time, uh, the satisfaction with their friendships. Um, and uh, this is the females, and then the males have the exact same observations. Uh, the whole block is the phenotypic correlation. So for example, there is a negative phenotypic correlation between family functioning uh, and well-being. Uh, family functioning is a negative assessment uh, to explain to you the negative association. But the majority of this association is accounted for by overlapping genetics. So it's not causing anything. It's just the same underlying gene that makes some people more sensitive to this uh, uh, family function, negative family functioning, or maybe your behavior is actually uh, making problems in a family based on your genotype, there will be this association. So as you can see for all these uh, four phenotypes, uh, the majority of the phenotypic correlation is blue, meaning that it's mainly driven by genes. Uh, and in any association you find between well-being and anything else, genes will do matter. So that's why the genetically informative designs will be very helpful. That's what it is. Uh, of course, I'm always the one who's presenting all the work. Uh, like Bo also said, there are a lot of people doing the hard work, collecting the data, analyzing the data, writing the papers. Uh, so there's a big group of people and of course the funders. Uh, we've discussed the funding uh, landscape uh, in the United States and in Europe. Not very optimistic about it, but it's just the way it is. Uh, we should keep on pushing, keep on doing beautiful research showing that uh, we need the money. Um, and of course, thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you so much uh, for your talk. I'm Brooke. I'm a graduate student here at UW-Madison, and I'm really interested in genetic and environmental factors underlying externalizing behaviors. Um, so one of my questions actually has to do with something that you briefly touched on in your talk. And, oh, okay. I hope this is better. Um, one huge challenge in the implementation of polygenic scores is their lack of accuracy for individuals not of European ancestry. And this disparity highlights the Eurocentric bias of genome-wide association studies and could potentially increase health disparities. What do you think needs to change in the field to address this challenge? And could you also tell us a little bit more about your endeavor of contacting all of the different twin registries around the world? Yeah, very good a question. Uh, I, well, I'm, I'm very positive in that sense. I think the, the polygenic risk score approach in the end will have a huge contribution to many, uh, many uh, phenotypes. Um, actually, for a couple of phenotypes like cardiovascular disease, uh, it's already used. The biggest problem, uh, the biggest limitation is, of course, that the results are now, as you mentioned, based on European ancestry samples. Uh, this is uh, scientifically a problem, but ethically also a problem that we have more information for certain population than for others, which obstructs the implementation in, in clinical settings. Uh, so until we have that. Uh, we can't use it uh, in a proper way. Um, the Broad Institute, uh, for example, uh, is investing loads of money to get sampling done in different countries, uh, to have actually the DNA collected and being transferred to a laboratory and being assessed. Um, uh, and then, let alone, you also have to do the phenotyping. Uh, so that will, be, that will take time. Uh, what we are doing for well-being is currently uh, relying on the twin registers that already exist. Uh, and like I said, it's surprising there is there is now a, a special issue also in twin registries. There are many twin registries around the world. Um, the well-being phenotype is, of course, not always included in their data collection. 
but most often they have collected something uh, along the lines of depression and there could be one item. Um, so it's a first step. Uh, so we, are, uh, we just send them all an invitation to contribute, to run similar analysis on their data. We provided the scripts and the explanation and they send it to us and then we will do a meta analysis to see if, we, if there's a similar genetic architecture what I expect is that if the, the environment is more difficult, you will see a, a lower heritability and a, and a higher environmental effect. But in the end, I think that the polygenic risk score um, for well-being, for example, uh, will be part of the assessment uh, in uh, psychiatry uh, and not as the, the factor. It's just one other factor that could actually be used to distinguish people to get a better hold of the phenotype. So somewhere along the lines, maybe it takes 10 years, maybe it takes 15 years. If we get someone in with depressive symptoms uh, and we also could take a DNA sample uh, and we find someone with a very uh, well high polygenic score for uh, depression, for example, uh, the chances that there is a biological problem are higher when, when someone has a high polygenic score versus someone with a low polygenic score. The well-being polygenic score could be another way also of treating people. If someone has a very high polygenic score for well-being, but a lot of depressive symptoms, maybe positive psychology interventions that become stronger and more reliable by the day can be used to help someone who suffers. Um, so it will be, uh, well, maybe in, will improve not personalized medicine because I don't think we will ever get to the personalized level, but at least stratified medicine. Uh, Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Stein. I'm also a grad student at UW-Madison. Um, I study children's emotional development. Um, and I'm really interested in um, kind of the ways you laid out um, that are kind of create challenges for studying the role of environmental factors um, in well-being. Um, and one of the things that, that I was struck by um, is um, your findings that some of the kind of strongest confounding effects from genetic factors um, come from um, environmental variables where people are using um, subjective appraisal measures. So things like the social connectedness that you um, covered in that last slide. Um, and as you note in one of your papers, it seems very possible that this is maybe because um, there are you know, general genetic predispositions towards positive or negative life appraisals and that's seeping into both your dependent and independent variable in these relationships. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of wondering, given this, do you see this as just an argument for not using subjective appraisal measures when we're trying to measure these environmental variables and kind of sticking to um, more objective measures, even if they're more abstracted away? Or do you think there's a place for those subjective appraisal measures? And if so, kind of where? Yeah, very, very important point. I, th I think uh, uh, we should never stop doing something if it's complex or has a bias, as long as we are uh, at some point able to quantify the bias. So for example, what we will do in the EMA study is that we are going to also hand out Bluetooth beacons uh, so we are inviting the twins and we are asking them for five people in their close environment because uh, what we found is that there's a very strong heritability if you ask people how often they see someone uh, and you have a, squ a scale that says uh, very often, often, not that often, sometimes, and never, that's that is heritable. Meaning that the fact that I consider something to be often is different than what you consider. So we're going to ask these questions in the EMA design, but we're also going to hand out the Bluetooth beacon. So we have an objective assessment uh, on how often they see these people and their subjective assessment that makes, us, makes it possible to quantify actually the bias. And as long as you know how big the bias is, the, then in other studies, if we quantify it once, it's a Dutch population, so there has a limitation for generalizability to another population, but people can use this quantification of a bias in a different study to actually correct. Uh, and, and this is a very, it's a difficult study. Uh, so I think every now and then uh, such studies should be done and then other people can use it uh, because we can't rely on objective measures in very big groups. And, and the, the biggest problem uh, 
uh, in most of the studies in the field of well-being or in any complex traits is sample size. So um, one thing that we did in our first G1 study uh, was because of the discussion at that time point from what is well-being or what is a complex phenotype, uh, we uh, did a qualitative quantitative trade-off. So at, at what trade-off doesn't it really matter if you have a very biased measure, so only one item, versus a very detailed measure. And we showed that the sample size we had in this first genome-wide association study was above the trade-off. So it didn't really matter if that some uh, samples had only one item while others had a full scale of five items. And that we combined satisfaction with life with quality of life because we had a huge sample. So I think we need studies that have smaller samples and very deeply phenotyped and we need the huge studies. Uh, they also showed, for example, for uh, the GWAS for eye problems, uh, that you can assess the particular eye problem an individual has, which is very complex and time consuming, or you can just ask, do you wear glasses? Mm -hmm. If you ask the second question in a very large sample, it's enough to have the identification of the first set of genes that is related to eye problems. Thank you. Um, so a second question that I had was your meta-analysis from 2015 demonstrated that genetic factors explain about 35% of the variance in well-being. What do you see as the implications of heritability estimates like these for intervention work? How can we use heritability estimates and genetic variants from GWAS to increase well-being in our society and inform potential interventions? Yeah, the, the biggest implication is that we should realize that everybody is different and that part of the difference is accounted for by genes. Um, we're also uh, um, uh, trying, because it's hard to also to do, is to set up uh, intervention studies in twin designs uh, to see what the heritability of the change in intervention is. So you should, the only thing you should really realize is if you try to help someone, that the intervention you propose works for some and not for everybody. Uh, and that's not only when you try to help someone, it's just in general life uh, that some things work for some people and not for others. If you uh, draw the parallel, for example, to exercise behavior or the fact that we all should move more, then all the interventions uh, so far are not correct because we are assuming that everybody's going to make the same change, which will never happen. So at some point we should realize that we should ask people or give a, a palette of different options for interventions and then you have like you have a trillion of positive psychology interventions if you give people a list of 10 and say well give it a try and most importantly stop if you don't like it or if you don't have the feeling that it works because we also are very hard in stopping things that we already started uh, if you do that you will find your own intervention that works for you and you can also modify it because these interventions are pre-described, like count your blessings. You actually should sit down every night, write it down. That's just impossible for everybody. You're not going to sit down every night, but you can adapt it to your own lifestyle. And still there is improvement in some people and others, well, after a couple of weeks, realize that it doesn't work for them. So it's, it's mainly the realization that people are different. Uh, and we, it sounds silly, but we simply ignore it in everything we do. Um, so you noted that um, one challenge of um, kind of applying GWAS-like methods to environmental factors is that we really just don't have a sense of the structure of the environment in the same way we do the structure of the genome. And also, um, one thing that I thought was really interesting you noted is that the structure probably isn't even stable. Um, so I was wondering if you could just um, speak a little more about what you mean by that and kind of what work in that direction would look like to kind of help us get at least kind of a baseline understanding of what the structure might be. Yeah, so in, in, uh, in comparison to the genome, so for the genome, we have the human genome. It, they said it was finished in 2000 and then every year you get it's finished again and mm -hmm. again and again. Um, but it's, it's getting more and more detailed and we just know a lot about the human genome, the structure, the link between different uh, genetic variants which we use in the analysis. For the environment, um, I think it's not that it's completely unstructured. Uh, it's just that it's, it's, it never has been uh, brought really into detail in what the structure could be and where the differences in structure could be. Um, 
And that is partly because of the fact that I said it's not a random set of uh, uh, variables. So there are certain environmental variables that I've never been exposed to due to the fact that I live in a certain area or in, live in a certain part of the world uh, or don't exercise somewhere and so, as other people do. Um, so I think it's just a matter of, uh, and we could do that because we, data collection is getting easier and easier, getting loads and loads of data and try to understand the structure and the different levels of the structure. Um, and, and I think that takes time, but it still is always better than just pick one environmental variable and ignore uh, all the other variables. Oops. Um, so I want to just weave together two comments that you made in the talk. Um, one uh, was at the very end where you were speculating about how, in response to another question about how uh, this kind of information may be useful. And you gave the example of uh, if there were, um, uh, if a person had high scores on a well being polygenic um, score uh, and was depressed, it may uh, suggest that there are certain well-being or positive psychology kinds of treatment options that may be um, uh, uh, appropriate to explore with that particular patient. Earlier on in the presentation of, um, of one study, uh, you showed us that the um, simple zero order correlations between well-being, I believe it was well-being, neuroticism, and depression were all quite high, and you combine them uh, uh, in, uh, to improve reliability. And um, I wonder here what kind of um, finding you might obtain if rather than combining them, you actually uh, um, uh, uh, looked at the uh, portion of well-being that was not explained by neuroticism and by um, depression to isolate a more, if you will, pure form of well-being unconfounded by those negative attributes uh, and um, whether that would just reveal something quite different. Yeah, very good question. Um, yeah, so the genetic correlation often is around 0 0.7, 0 0.75. So it's very high, meaning that there is a, 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 well, a large part of the underlying genetic variants are overlapping for uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, it's depressive symptoms, it's not a diagnosis, it's symptoms uh, separated by individuals uh, and well-being. The approach we are currently taking for uh, depression and, and uh, happiness specifically happiness, and for resilience and happiness is doing a GWAS by subtraction. Uh, and that's a method that's developed to especially answer this question. So if you have a GWAS for depressive symptoms and a GWAS for happiness based on the UK Biobank, so it's again, uh, only single item, well, the sim depressive symptoms multiplies, but happiness is one item. You do a GWAS by subtraction. Uh, we, we are just currently running these analysis and we see that we can identify a couple of genetic variants that are really specific to happiness. Uh, there's a lot of overlap and there are genetic variants specific to depression. The idea of that particular project was not actually for depression. It was based on the fact that I uh, often get the question, is there a difference between resilience and well-being? Um, and so we thought, well, one way to answer this question is do a GOS by subtraction. So we because the UK Biobank and many people don't have a very good resilience measure, we took the approach that Ken Kentler uh, always takes for resilience is by uh, taking people that uh, have uh, experienced life events and didn't develop depressive symptoms. Uh, so that's how we started the project. And then we actually observed in the UK Biobank that the uh, phenotypic correlation between that new measure and depressive symptoms is 0.98. So it's it's very hard to assess resilience. So at that point, we, we expanded the study and say, okay, well, let's also look at depression and well-being. Uh, so we are working on it. And I think it will be very valuable in the end. I'm not sure if that will in the end uh, change the polygenic score approach because the differences 
uh, is limited. So uh, it could be, uh, I think that will be at some point if we jump into the rare variants, uh, that that will be more helpful to really identify some unique individuals. So from a clinical perspective, that would be useful. From a population perspective, uh, not. So that's the problem. Um, so I think the polygenic score still there, 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 there are people because of the, the phenotypic or the gender correlation point seven five, there are people that have a disbalance in the polygenic scores. And I think if you have both, which is easy, you only need one DNA sample, uh, you can identify different groups of people. Mike, if I could follow up on that question, yeah. um, could you be more specific in describing the composite phenotype that you, how, how did you put the, three, the neuroticism, depression, and well-being together for the GWAS study? Yeah, so we had for uh, most of the individuals, we had uh, depressive symptoms, survey-based. We had neuroticism, uh, mainly NEO, uh, some other uh, uh, personality skills. Uh, and we had satisfaction with life and positive effect. We actually distinguished right. these, these two as well. Um, and then we uh, run a model-based uh, GWAS study uh, where we test for each SNP, we tested, we had different models. So a SNP was actually uh, associated to all four phenotypes, uh -huh. three out of four in the I different see. combinations, to two out of four in different I combinations, see. and to out, one out uh -huh. of four, and then actually balance these uh, different models to find the best fitting one. Okay. And, and uh, for the data that you presented for the exposome study, was that based on simply well-being or was that on the composite? No, that was satisfaction with life. So that was very life. specific. Okay. Uh, so, so one of the questions that I had, have you done that same type? I found the, the, uh, the safety finding fascinating and also really appreciated the, the detailed discussion around controlling for the confounding variables. But um, have you done a similar analysis for neuroticism from the standpoint of the you know, environment or the exposome? No, we didn't do that. Uh, an, another group at our university that runs the uh, Netherlands study of uh, anxiety and depression, the NESDA sample, uh, took the same approach for uh, depression, uh, and they found uh, evidence for uh, air pollution. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I guess what I was thinking was that, you know, while the genes may be shared across these uh, subtypes of phenotypes, you know, the environmental influences might be quite different. Um, yeah, well, of course, the, the important thing that is lacking from the uh, exposome-wide study we did is the subjective assessment of safety of your uh -huh. environment. Yes. And that could be linked to the, yeah. the neurotic part. Um, so in our newest data collection, because we were doing that study while we were also setting up a new survey, we implemented all these subjective safety assessments. I because see. if you give this finding to policymakers, they are going to develop one program to change safety in all the neighborhoods, which is ridiculous because safety to me is something different. Maybe I want more outdoor lights while someone else uh, wants something different. Right. Um, and safety is also very complex because it could be either traffic related or uh, crime related or, and that of course varies a lot based on the socioeconomic right. status of the neighborhoods. Thank you. Well, while I have the microphone, we have one virtual, we have a couple of virtual questions. I'll ask one and then we can pick up from the audience. This is again from Cecilia Hilliard. And she asks, can you tell us about uh, anything about the general function of the 300 genes that you identified to be significant in relation to the GWAS study? The simple answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, it, 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 and everybody can just look it up in any database. Uh, because, but um, because of the complexity of the phenotype, I think we, we went to the limit of finding where these genes are expressed. And I don't think we could claim anything more than doing that uh, on the biological functioning. So we need uh, way more significant variants someday uh, to get a better hold of what it really means, uh, biologically speaking. On the other hand, I wonder if in the complexity of all the systems, we will ever say this is one of the biological pathways. I think it's, it's way too complex, uh, but maybe someday. Thank you. I wasn't sure if you had a follow-up. You stole my question, my first question. I was gonna ask that same question and it, you know, it sounds like the answer that there's tremendous overlap although a little bit of evidence for dissociability of 
of kind of well-being or you know versus neuroticism and i guess we've been struggling a lot with this in our kids studies of like how to measure measure resilience and well-being in a way that isn't the absence of these things that we know are risk factors right so i guess i'd like you to if you have thoughts about this like like how much do you think there's really this truly separate construct of sort of like well-being that is very dissociable from like low neuroticism, these other things, or is it kind of a bipolar dimension of things? Yeah, I, th I think it's mainly a bipolar dimension. I think, but I think the biggest problem is that we often stop measuring at the absence of symptoms. So any childhood psychopathology scale, like the child behavior checklist or anything else, is talking about problems. And that's what then we end up with every child that doesn't have a problem with this gear, a score of zero being the control group. So the only thing we should start doing is expanding these skills. So that's why the Cantrell letter, I think, is a very simple but a very elegant measure. Uh, it's very stable. It has a high reliability and it's, it's a score from zero to 10. So then you have this continuum and you have the children everywhere on the scale. And, uh, we tried using this scale in uh, in classrooms with young children, and maybe also due to our Dutch system, because everything that you do at school is rated on a scale from zero to ten, so they exactly know the meaning of every number on the scale. But if you do, if you ask children twice a day simply to to write that number down or press a button, and you get these patterns of children over time. You can learn a lot and you can also pick out problems in children way earlier than it actually is expressed in the child in problems at school or problems in their behavior because you can see a sudden fluctuation or a sudden drop. Um, so I think it's largely part of the same continuum. But I only think that we can learn a lot uh, from the other side of the coin. Um, the problem is that I'm not sure yet. Uh, this is all for the hedonic measures. Uh, and uh, I think if we jump into the eudaimonic measures, like purpose and meaning, um, I can imagine that we add more, uh, although the genetic correlation between hedonic and eudaimonic is also 0.7. So uh, there's a lot to learn. Hi, my name is Matt Hearing from Marquette University. Um, I'm just a professor there. Um, I apologize if this question comes off as naive because naive, I'm a preclinical researcher. But I'm curious as to why measures of cognition aren't incorporated into the well-being scale, given that we there's a, a large thought that that impairments and you know, flexibility and things like that can negatively impact quality of life. That well, they are not in these scales. Um, there are some studies that we have a lot of cognition measures uh, and, and sometimes made the link. Uh, but we didn't study it in detail, uh, but the only thing I know so far is that it's a very complex association. Um, so the, the, the first studies that jumped into it um, were starting with the perspective of a linear association. Uh, so better cognitive development, better cognitive skills, higher well-being, and that turned out not to be the case. Um, so. I'm not aware of a very good study that jumped into the details. I know there's a lot of data available. So uh, if you're interested, <laughs> you're more than welcome to Thank study you. it. Hi, um, my name is Ashton and I'm a grad student here at UW-Madison. Um, and I know that there's this sort of cliche that comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, and I'm really fascinated by um, your conceptualization of the exposome specifically. And I was wondering if you were looking at opportunities for comparison, like specifically between like income, maybe even within a given neighborhood. Um, and if there's any sort of like maybe genetic predisposition that makes people more susceptible um, to like, I guess, feeling the pressures of this comparison. We didn't do that. I think also the Netherlands is not the ideal country to do so. Uh, it's not that we uh, lack inequality. Uh, but we uh, have way less inequality than many other countries in the world. Uh, and in our data, uh, our data are not representative in that sense, because we are a voluntary sample. Um, and we have highly, high, more highly educated people with uh, uh, more higher income. Um, we are less 
bias than many other psalms because we are driven by the fact that people uh, uh, get birth of give are a twin or give birth to a twin, uh, and that's a socioeconomic status independent. Um, so I think we can't answer that question, um, but I think it, it you will find differences. Uh, right, thank you. But very complex. That's that's really the gene environment interplay uh, that that will. Uh, that will arise, make it very complex, but uh, important. We have a, another virtual question here. Um, a question from Joseph Bluestein, uh, asking whether or not you've repeated the quality of life survey later in the pandemic. Yeah, we did, but we didn't look at the data yet. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, we, if for, we did it in children specifically. We have now five assessments in children. Uh, and we also actually, well, we didn't really repeat it. We started with a very big survey uh, to all the 200,000 participants uh, in uh, October of 2019. And then everything was stopped due to the pandemic. Then we suddenly, we, we directly sent out this new survey as an in-between and we continued the other survey after, well, when the world returned a bit back to normal. Um, so we will have the data, but they are not available yet. Thank you. I, I really love the concept of the episome. Um, find it very inspiring because of the long-term possibility to identify something that's actionable. And relating that back to the concept of GWAS, you, you mentioned that some of the early theories for the genetics of well-being, as we're finding in psychiatry broadly, were initially hoping to find maybe a handful of really critical genes with very large effects, but of course, that's, that's simply just not been the case for complex traits. And so relating that back to the, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I might be mixed up the term, epi, the um, uh, exosome, exosome, exposome. Um, I'm wondering whether you would theorize at this point that it might be likely or unlikely to find a handful of really key factors in the environment that we could target, or if it's going to be more likely that it's many, many small effects. If it's the latter, whether it might be possible to, to find where they converge, or also the, the degree to which the answer to that question might depend on if we're thinking about the group average versus individuals. And relating that back to, to what you said about the genetic architecture being something that we understand very well. Um, Another kind of related question I had was that also, of course, genetic architecture is, is fixed as far as we know, um, whereas the environment is always changing. You've pointed out some factors in the environment, such as living in a city versus living, a, living in a rural area and maybe not having access to green space. And these are things that didn't always exist. So I'm wondering if also the answer to that first question about a large effect in the environment, if that would maybe change over time. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think um, we are in, in, a, in a, at a time point that there will be uh, a lot of progress. So there are different developments that will be combined to uh, make this progress. So for the first one is the, the, the real like ignorant data different approaches, uh, either machine learning models or just regression models with a lot of variables. Um, in combination, and that in that sense, we, we might distinguish uh, environmental factors that have some kind of tiny effect from the ones that we don't see any effect, reduce a bit of the, the big group of variables. Uh, a next approach would then be to apply a network analysis, because I don't think it will be a couple of major environmental factors. I think it will be uh, in a network, but I think there will be uh, a set of networks uh, and then the, the most complex thing that you mentioned at the end is the development. So the environment of a child is different than the environment of an adolescent, different from a young adult to an elder, older adult to an elderly. So in contrast to the genome, uh, that's a big difference. Um, so there will not never be a stable underlying network. So you should study that in every state of life um, to get different answers. But I think in the end, with network approaches and data-driven approaches, we will get better answers uh, than we currently have. It will never be the final answer. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>
Hi, Lana Grasser from Wayne State in Detroit. Thank you for this talk. Kind of building on this topic, I was going to ask if you had any data on stability of environments like you had with genetics. So I guess my question with what we were just mentioning then would be, do you have any idea from the data that you have or hypotheses about when ideal times might be to intervene at the level of environment? Is there any sort of key sensitive period there for well-being? Yeah, actually, in, in this study, we uh, had a couple of um, years of data. Uh, and um, so there was, a bit, there was a strong stability in that sense. Um, the, the problem is um, that countries are all different in that. So in the Netherlands, people don't move around that much. <laughs> so, so we have uh, the postal codes of all the twin pairs. Uh, and we have the postal codes where they were born. Um, and we are now trying to quantify the number of times people moved and if that created a substantial change in their environmental exposure. Um, so far, what we see, it, it didn't. So we don't have the ideal data to answer the question. I think a country like the US would be way better in that sense because you move around way more than we do because we can move and st stay at the same job and move to another city, and which is similar to the other city. So uh, no, there's there's... Not a lot available yet, uh, but a lot to study. Thank you. And I, I just had one more broader question. A lot of what you've talked about has been the subjective aspects of well-being. And I wonder if you or others have looked at the integration of any objective aspects of well-being. So maybe looking at facets of physical health. Yeah, my question before you gave the example would be, what is an objective <laughs> measure of well-being? Um, uh, my, my definition that I always use is uh, feeling well and functioning well. So that is subjective. Um, and uh, there is an association, of course, with health. Uh, but it's also way more complex than we, uh, we tend to understand. Uh, it's not that, well, if people have physical problems, they often have a reduction in their well-being, but that actually they bounce back. So it's with the whole resilience factor, it's very complicated. Um, so it's very hard to define an objective measure of well-being, to my opinion. Hi, I'm Nicole Moon from University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, so I was wondering, you've talked a lot about how potentially our genes regulate and, and make us more likely to live or do certain things. And I was sort of wondering, in terms of how this relates back to how do we help the people who are suffering, do you think there's going to be an interplay between genes that make you more susceptible to other environments and how that network, network might work and sort of also what you think the role or if there is a role for epigenetics to play in that in you know, the way that our genes are responding to the environment or, and being regulated. Yeah, one, one uh, example is a study uh, based on the Netherlands trend register data that I was not involved in is where we looked at the association between uh, uh, urban environments and the development of schizophrenia. Uh, so it has been shown that schizophrenia is more frequent in urban environments. And we showed in the study that that's mainly due to genetic predisposition. Um, and well, the simple answer would, that you know that then people would not live in an urban environment. But like I said, where you live is largely based on uh, where you are economically uh, linked to. Um, and the same would, would hold for uh, well-being. Um, at some point, but it's very hard. We, we tried uh, to use the polygenic score for well-being to predict the environmental exposure in the environment-wide study, uh, but we didn't find any significant effect. Uh, for many reasons, the, the polygenic score for well-being is not very strong to the complexity of the phenotype. And although it's a huge sample, it's still not big enough to be a strong predictor. But at some point, we will be able to uh, predict environmental exposure based on the well-being genotype. And then also, maybe in the far, far future, recommend people where they would be happier. Um, uh, on the other hand, genetics is, uh, is complex, but it's also just how you feel. So if you live somewhere and you don't feel happy, that's partly driven by your genotype. It's not often easy to change, but you should realize that that's probably not the environment that is the best for you. And you can, of course, survive for a while because it's necessary, but at some point you need to make the change. Uh, 
which is simply said, but always very difficult to do. But genetics is who you are. It's not something that is uh, somewhere that you can't use. It's, you, you are genetics the whole day, every day. Thank you so much. Can I, can I just to follow up on that a little bit? Um, I, I was wondering myself about whether or not is there a genetic correlation between well-being and other psychiatric illnesses besides depression? So for example, with schizophrenia? Yeah, very strong also. It's, it's strong, it's, it's a strong- a Less strong than of course with depressive symptoms, but- uh, But it's a strong genetic yeah. correlation. Um, I'm Natalie Pilgrim. I'm a grad student coming from Emory and the Yerke Center. Um, thank you for this talk. It's given me like, so, so much to think about. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. I, I really loved the um, sort of GWAS style exposome plot that you showed with the different, different quote variants. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about the benefits of doing data visualization or analysis that way versus things like predictive modeling. Um, or uh, uh, data reduction component and principal component analysis, just different ways of showing that kind of complex data. Yeah, I think you, uh, you touched upon a, another very complex thing with the uh, exposure wide is of course the intercorrelation between all the variables. Um, so you have to do, uh, we did some kind of data reduction. I think it, I do not prefer one method over the other. Um, but because I'm data driven, I like to keep as many possible variables as uh, they are. There are because, of course, if you do uh, like a factor model, you lose a lot of uh, specific information. Uh, but it really depends. You need large sample sizes if you have if you want to study uh, large sets of data. And I think you always have to make that trade off. Makes sense. Thank you. And don't make strong claims or, uh, about direction of causation or all these kinds of things because uh, most methods don't have the, uh, uh, the possibility to do so. Hi, I'm Pea. I'm a, re I'm a research assistant at the NIH. And I was curious if you, um, in your well-being uh, measures, controlled for significant life changes, such as sudden loss of a family member and how that may impact um, emotional support network or recent loss of jobs. And if um, previous well-being um, scores uh, show how individuals may be able to adapt to those significant life changes, if some people may be more vulnerable to these or others may not. Yeah, well, so far we didn't do that because um, uh, in our, uh, in a very large sample, the prevalence of uh, very extreme life events is relatively low. Uh, it's also, it's a group of uh, relatively young adults. Um, so we didn't do it. We do it for the, the GOS by subtraction at what, where, what I was mentioning to, to use a resilience score. Um, the only thing that we, for example, uh, did do is in the COVID papers, we removed the people that actually already were exposed to COVID themselves uh, because we wanted to uh, study the uh, experience uh, on their well being, uh, regardless, uh, or were actually correcting for not having been uh, ill at that moment. And that was easy to do in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, of course, later on, it was impossible. But uh, yeah, so there are studies that show that certain life events like uh, losing your uh, partner uh, has a forever change on your well-being but that studies that look at mean differences uh, and I think if you uh, would include uh, individual differences you will see different effects some people bounce back more easily than other people thank you <laughs> um uh, really two sort of interrelated questions. The first is I'm curious why you are so pessimistic about quote, objective measures of well-being. Um, and it's not in any way to um, minimize the importance of the interpretive element. Uh, I uh, am a firm believer in the importance of that. But when, when humans interpret an event, if two different individuals interpret an event, the same event differently, uh, it can express itself in behavior. Uh, and if we're clever enough and uh, 
uh, sufficiently comprehensive, uh, I, um, uh, I at least um, want to think that we have at least the prospect of developing um, more objective measures, if you will. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that um, we haven't really given it a chance, we being the field. Uh, and so uh, I'm just curious if there are data sets that you are, that you're aware of that are not yet published that lead you to this pessimistic answer, or is it based on some other um, uh, conjectures? Thank you. I've never been uh, put in a pessimistic uh, <laughs> group of people, so uh, that's a life change now. Um, I think there's a difference between being able to develop an objective measure versus being able to apply this objective measure in any setting. So I think we will be able, for example, again, if you have the UK Biobank, uh, they have now MRI data, they have metabolomics data, uh, at some point, we will be able to find something more objective uh, that could explain uh, a part of the variance in well-being. Uh, but then the I'm not sure if we can ever use it. So I think that we will at some point uh, have reliable assessments either via MRI or, or EG or uh, if we have very large samples. Um, but then we will never put uh, everybody into an MRI scanner if we could also ask uh, how they feel in one question. So it's not that I'm uh, pessimistic about the possibilities, well, more about facial behavior, voice, uh, the natural language processing, which we can measure with well. Yeah, I, I, I'm a strong believer in the natural language processing, but I think there is also. Uh, um, uh, there's a heritable component, um, there's a lot of variability, uh, and the question is, is that more objective? Um, uh, maybe it is because people just put something on, on Instagram or Facebook without thinking about it, um, but it has that many biases um, that I'm not sure if it will be a like a better objective always sounds as if it would be better than just asking someone to rate their life on a scale from zero to 10. I don't think we will make it better, but we are going to select the social media data to add to the survey questions to get more like a real time well being and fluctuations and not to replace. Uh, we do it in the same individuals that have an assessment of well being over the past 15 years. So um, optimistic of combining. <laughs> Different messages. Okay, so let's take a break for lunch. Uh, we're going to come back at 2.30 for the next.